This time on Motor Week 91, we drive the cheapest American car, Plymouth Sundance America. Then we take a quick look at the more expensive Subaru Legacy Turbo, and another at the very expensive Infiniti Q45 with active suspension. And we'll tell you how expensive our long-term test cars have been. So come drive with us next. Motor Week 91, television's automotive magazine, is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. Your host from Motor Week 91, John Davis. Well, hello and welcome again to Motor Week 91. We're glad to have you with us. We've seen a lot in the car ads lately about how small cars from Chrysler were judged to be better than ones from Honda. Those ads reminded us that we hadn't driven any of Chrysler's small cars in a while, and maybe it was time to take another look. The car we chose to test is this Plymouth Sundance America. Like Plymouth and Dodge America models before it, the Sundance America puts an emphasis on value. It's the least expensive American car you can buy. But let's see what else it has going for it. The Plymouth Sundance and its twin, the Dodge Shadow, were originally conceived as basic transportation. They were supposed to replace the Omni and Horizon in 1987. Instead, Chrysler pushed them quickly up market. Now, with the America series, Chrysler has reduced content and returned them to their economy car routes. You can drive a Sundance America off the dealer's lot for as little as $7,699. Add the options most people want, like air conditioning and a radio, and our two-door test car still comes in at a very reasonable $9,189. The America gets its power from Chrysler's 2.2-liter four-cylinder engine. This latest version of Chrysler's reliable standard four makes 93 horsepower and 122 pound-feet of torque. Economy-minded owners will be pleased with the engine's layout. Maintenance points are clearly marked and easy to reach minimizing frustration for shade tree mechanics. The engine is connected to a five-speed manual gearbox. We expected the usual clunky Chrysler Econobox shifter, and were happily surprised to find a unit as slick as some Japanese shifters. If shifting doesn't impress you, a three-speed automatic is optional. In testing, our Sundance trotted from zero to 60 in 11.4 seconds. Not bad for basic transportation. Quarter mile took 18.2 seconds, ending at 73 miles per hour. The 2.2 pulls strongly for a simple eight valve four, but the lack of the balance shaft found in the larger 2.5 liter engine means substantial buzz and vibration throughout the power band. The clutch, however, was smooth and positive. Like many Econo boxes, the Sundance America understeers mildly into corners. Accelerate out, and the modest 93 horsepower pulls the car along without any surprises. Power steering is standard and provides plenty of road feel. When called upon for rapid reactions, the fairly quick high-effort steering responds well. While its cornering limits can be surpassed easily, the Sundance America has enough grip to handle typical accident avoidance maneuvers. Brakes consist of power-assisted disc in the front and drums in the rear. Brake pedal effort is high, and unlike the steering wheel, it transmits no valuable information to the driver. Stops were acceptable at 133 feet from 60 miles per hour. But the rears became more sensitive to lockup as our test progressed. After six tries, it was hard to manage a straight stop. Out on the highway, the ride is quite comfortable by Econobox standards, with little of the choppy ride found in some shorter wheelbase competitors. EPA gas mileage ratings are 23 city, 30 highway. We got a fine 28 miles per gallon. The Sundance America's 97-inch wheelbase and some careful interior packaging by Chrysler engineers has provided a remarkably roomy cabin. The dash is a one-piece design. While we can't get enthusiastic about the dull-looking plastic used in its molding, it's free of the squeaks and noises of a multi-piece assembly. Safety points go to Chrysler for including an airbag on its least expensive U.S.-made car. 
more expensive import competitors lack this essential safety feature. Unlike many econobox seats, the Sundance's buckets are thickly padded and quite supportive. The basic seat controls offer a decent range of driving positions, and the headrests actually have a wide enough adjustment range to accommodate tall drivers. The faces of the stark gauges are large and easy to read. There's a good selection for an econobox, but the omission of a tack in a manual transmission-equipped car, even an inexpensive one, disappoints us. Stock and dash-mounted controls are minimal. There's only what's needed. Most are concentrated in the center dash. Heat and ventilation controls are clean and well-marked. The optional AM-FM radio is set a bit low, but has efficient controls and a better sound than many basic music systems. And thanks to those practical Chrysler designers for including plenty of interior storage space. There's adequate rear seat room, too, more than one usually finds in a two-door compact. Adults can ride in reasonable comfort back here, and a folding seat back is standard. It's a nice addition to this hatchback that looks like a notchback's already generous trunk space. Unfortunately, liftover is very high, making it difficult to load heavy objects. The Sundance America may be the least expensive American car, but some imports, like the three-door Hyundai Excel, cost less. But the Hyundai doesn't offer as much standard equipment or as much rear seat room. The Hyundai also lacks an airbag and only offers a four-speed manual transmission as standard. The base Mazda 323 also costs less. Like the Hyundai, it has less standard equipment, but about the same rear seat room as the Sundance. The 323 also lacks an airbag, but has better handling and braking performance. In our safety check, the Sundance America passes with a driver's side airbag and rear shoulder belts. There's no passenger side airbag, and we don't expect ABS to be offered in a car of this price class. Our list of hits starts with the Sundance America's low price. We're also impressed with its many standard features, slick manual shifter, large trunk, and ample rear seat room. Misses include the high trunk liftover, lack of a tachometer, and harsh engine vibrations. But then we never expected the Sundance to compete with a Honda Accord. It's simple, basic transportation. Unlike many over-equipped competitors, which long ago ceased to be economical to buy. The Sundance America may belong to a segment where the greatest virtue remains low price, but it offers the economy car buyer much more. Proof that basic transportation can be more than the bare essentials, and that American value is more than just an advertising gimmick. Subaru has traditionally built quirky but rugged small cars, usually with four-wheel drive. In the past few years, Subaru's products have begun to compete in the mainstream. They've introduced models that compare with those from Honda, Toyota, and Nissan. The model that stands out the most is the Legacy Sedan, a family four-door with lots of room. It blends into the suburban background like no Subaru ever has. But Subaru isn't content to rest there. The Japanese carmaker is now offering more power. To accelerate their merge into the mainstream, they've introduced the Subaru Legacy Turbo. The official name for this new turbocharged Subaru is the Legacy Sports Sedan. Its Subaru shot at the market segment usually dominated by the cars of Europe. To attract buyers who normally wouldn't consider a sensible family car like the Legacy, the Sports Sedan gets a selection of special styling features. Starting at ground level, it wears 15-inch alloy wheels with high-performance rubber. At the tail, there is a wing for the rear deck. And up front is a deeper chin spoiler and a functional hood scoop. It feeds air to this 2.2-liter turbocharged flat-four engine. With 16 valves and a single overhead cam, it makes 160 horsepower and 181 pound-feet of torque. That launches the sports sedan to 60 and 8 seconds flat. The quarter-mile takes 16.1 seconds at 86 miles per hour, easily outrunning the standard legacy. But then the sports sedan is quite a different car. Its standard five-speed gearbox has been beefed up to handle the turbo's extra torque, but while offering a set of tight, quick ratios, it has a rather rubbery-feeling shifter. Fortunately, the turbo engine is strong and smooth with minimal lag, so that the sports sedan runs like a rabbit, slow shifter or not. Cornering is aided by a Subaru full-time four-wheel drive system that uses a viscous center and rear differential and a firmer suspension. It makes the Legacy feel more like the European cars it aspires to beat. 
Sports sedans with an automatic transmission get a different electronically controlled all-wheel drive system that distributes power similar to the Mercedes 4MATIC system. In hard cornering, front plow is minimal right up to the limit where it breaks into smooth, controllable rear wheel oversteer. The power steering is quick and offers good feedback so you can outrun the steering pump. Four-wheel disc with ABS are standard in the sports sedan and stop it from 60 and an average distance of 112 feet. Pedal pulsation is heavy, but all stops are straight and smooth. These are brakes as good as anything from BMW. Highway ride is also smooth. The Legacy Sports Sedan's fuel mileage is EPA rated at 19 City 25 Highway. We average 21 miles per gallon. While this hot Legacy may be able to go, stop, and handle like a German car, drivers looking for a European environment may be disappointed by the interior. There's nothing wrong with it. It's clean and efficient, but it lacks that continental style that one finds in even the cheapest BMW. On the other hand, it has more standard equipment than most competitors. It offers a set of firm, supportive, cloth-covered sports seats with both height and lumbar adjustments and a tilt wheel. Gauges are large and clean, if incomplete. Ventilation is controlled by a well-marked series of buttons and switches. Air conditioning is standard, as is the 80-watt AM FM cassette stereo. It has a crisp sound and easy-to-use control. Rear seat room is quite good. The standard power moonroof steals a bit of headroom, but most adults should be comfortable. Price-wise, the Subaru Legacy Sports Sedan will set you back $18,899. That's very close to the price of BMW's 318i. And while the Legacy Sports Sedan doesn't offer the prestige of the Beamer, it will match the German car for driving fun. The Subaru Legacy Sports Sedan is a strong and ambitious step forward for a company that most enthusiasts long ago dismissed as too weird to bother with. And if given a fair chance to impress, could end up in quite a few of those same enthusiast garages. Lisa Barrow recently traveled to Las Vegas. She didn't go to gamble away all the money she makes here at Motor Week, but to look at new automotive products. She attended a convention of SEMA, the Specialty Equipment Market Association. That's where manufacturers show all the automotive-related products that may or may not be of use to the car-driving public. Lisa's here to show us some of the products that impressed her. This is the 25th edition of the Specialty Equipment Market Association, or SEMA show. And once again, we're back in full force. Susan, my co-producer, and I are equipped with some very comfortable shoes and a lot of enthusiasm. After all, we have nearly one million square feet of exhibit space to cover in order to find some of the best new products out on the automotive aftermarket. This is a new product out on the market that's very handy if you do a lot of traveling. It's called the Whistler Interstate Travel Mate. It's very easy to use. You just punch in the state that you're traveling in, and we'll use North Carolina, and you punch in your location, and it'll tell you the closest gas station, hotel, or restaurant. It'll give you the exact exit to take, and it'll tell you how many miles it'll take to get to that destination. Probably one of the best things about this, though, is if you're on a long trip and you get a little bored, it's a lot of fun to play with. You can pick one up for a little under $100. Well, what next? Hey, uh, Susan, what do you think about this product? After talking it over, we settled on this new product. Lisa, we have an electronic dipstick. As you know, everyone hates to have to lift the hood of the car, pull out the dipstick, wipe it off, put it back in, pull it back out. We electronically sense the level of the oil, and you can do it from inside the car. Simply press the button, and if you're safe, it'll say, it'll green light will come on, say safe. If you have to add one quart, you have a yellow light or a red for two or more quarts. Also works on the transmission. Therefore, you can check your oil level every time you have your gas and do, for, do it from inside the cab. The electronic dipstick sells for $59.95. Now, we couldn't very well come to the SEMA show without showing you something that's neon. It's everywhere you look. This particular product is called Night Lights, and it's a fiber optic cable that goes just about anywhere. It comes in all different colors. The color that's running through this seat is a green. It's a little bit difficult to see because it's right in here. But if you take a look back here, you can kind of get an idea of what the green looks like. The whole thing sells for about $350, and for that, you get enough cable for two bucket seats or a bench. You get the light kit and all the colors. Nothing really outstanding in the way of clothing, but we couldn't resist a peek. Then it was on to our next new product. Ever go around a corner in your car and your coffee goes flying all over the place? Well, the answer is yes, you might like this new product we found. 
It's called the Incredible Calypso Beverage Holder. And when I tilt the back of this truck, you can see that the water stays in the cup. You can pick one up for about $29.95. Around the corner from the Incredible Beverage Holder, we found something that just might make your trip to the fuel pump a bit quicker. Mark, tell me a little bit about this. Well, basically, it's a fuel filler cap. You're replacing your traditional gas cap with a fuel filler cap. Uh, with a window from the exterior of the cap, and you simply just put the nozzle in, fill it up, take the nozzle out, and drive away. Fuel ease sells for $19.95. Okay, now we have just about enough time for one more new product. But where is my partner? Hey! Oh, my gosh. We found several auto security devices here at the SEMA show this year. This one's called the Lockomatic, and it's a lock for your shifter. It works with automatic transmissions, you just push the shifter up to park, turn the key, and it's locked. This item will be especially good if you drive a pickup truck or if you have an older car where the shifter can become disengaged. The Lockomatic won't go on sale until spring, and the price is expected to be around $117. If you'd like more information about some of the products we've shown you here at the SEMA show, drop us a line at Motor Week. That's in Owings Mills, Maryland, and the zip code is 21117. Until next time, Susan and I will keep you posted on the latest new products out on the market. Hey, Lisa, what about this new product? You never know what we'll show you next. Psst, it's a wheel cover. Art criticism isn't a Motor Week forte, but Randy Owens is an artist that any car fan can appreciate. This look at 10 years worth of his work highlights a unique style and use of color and shows just how exciting automotive art can be. If you haven't been able to obtain his works or just don't have the wall space, this book will allow you to enjoy his marvelous prints. Often at Motor Week, we test cars with adjustable suspensions. Up to now, all of these systems included shock absorbers or air springs with a limited number of stiffness settings. These systems provide somewhat improved handling feel, but always at the expense of ride quality. Such systems are attempts to make traditional passive suspensions more flexible to road and driving conditions. Now, however, the first true active suspension has come to the market. It is available as a $4,000 option on the 1991 Infiniti Q45. The system is as complex as it is costly. So how does it work? And more importantly, how well? The goal of active suspension is to keep the car body roughly parallel with the road surface. The car and driver should be able to maintain stability regardless of how rough the road becomes or how violent the maneuver. An analogy is how the cheetah, the fastest animal on earth, keeps its head vertical and body parallel to the surface, absorbing shocks with its legs without a change in trajectory. Another is the downhill skier flexing and bending his legs in response to information about the terrain received from the feet and senses. The Infinity Active Suspension consists of an actuator at each wheel that does most of the work of the traditional shock absorber and spring. It is fed by an engine-driven oil pump. G sensors attached to a computer monitor the bounce, pitch, roll, and height of the vehicle. Signals are then sent to a pressure control unit that feeds hydraulic fluid to the wheel actuators as needed. Pressure in some actuators may rise while others are decreased. For instance, in a corner, roll is suppressed by increasing pressure to the actuators at the outer wheels and decreasing pressure at the inner wheels. Driving results are graphic. On a skid pad, this Q45 remains much closer to level than a Q45 without active suspension. Likewise, on this rough road, far less movement reaches the passenger compartment. We took this active Q45 to Pocono International Raceway to see just how much of the car's composure we could compromise. The first thing we noticed was an improvement in the Q45's overall solid feel. It is now more Germanic. The active suspension gives the taunt resistance we expected, but without the bump harshness of the standard Q suspension. Rumble and bounce normally associated with rough pavement were almost non-existent. Nosedive is reduced during hard braking and during full throttle acceleration. In corners, drivers were able to brake later and hop back on the accelerator sooner. The inertia caused by the 4,000-pound mass of the Q45 becomes less a factor in maintaining driver control. In a slalom, the rear end has less tendency to come around unexpectedly. And while still not a tossable car, it now slides much easier. 
The back roads around Pocono have lots of frost heaves and potholes. While the active suspension did not eliminate their discomfort, it did reduce it. Kickback through the steering wheel, something that can cause a driver to lose control when bumps are hit at high speed, was also drastically reduced. Yet, despite all of these complex suspension components, the feeling of the driver being connected to the road was not noticeably impaired. Visually, the only exterior difference between active and passive Q45 sedans is this decal below the back glass. Inside, a switch has been added that raises the Q45 20 millimeters. The extra ground clearance is for tackling rally rough roads. Like an airbag suspension, the active system also adjusts vehicle height for heavy and lopsided loads. Now the verdict. Is the expense and effort behind active suspension worth it? Honestly, both the cost and complexity of the system cause us concern, but both should come down in the future. At its present level of development, we don't see active suspensions appealing to typical drivers or those that demand pure performance. But that could change since Lotus, Volvo, and others are spending lots of R&D money on active suspensions. The Infiniti Q45 system successfully achieves the combination of an uncompromised highway ride and above average road holding. An impressive achievement that makes an already impressive car more so. Our car of the week is a 1940 Pontiac Silver Street two-door coupe. It belongs to David and Mary Swierczkowski of Weirton, West Virginia. If you have a car that means a lot to you, show it to us. We'll consider it for Car of the Week. Just send a good color photo and a self-addressed envelope to Motor Week, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. That address works for any of us here at Motor Week. Don't be concerned about the lack of a street name or number. The post office always finds us. Next, we find Lisa Barrow, prepared with all the latest motor news. This week, John, we've decided to move our new Under the Sun feature up front to give MotorWeek viewers a better look at an important new model. It isn't very often that Honda introduces a new car, so the arrival of the Accord wagon is big news. I spent the weekend in Marysville, Ohio, at the car's official introduction, and my initial impressions are very positive. Based on the Accord sedan, the wagon uses the same 107.1-inch wheelbase. Power comes from the Accord's 2.2-liter four-cylinder engine, which makes 125 horsepower in LX trim or 140 in the EX. The suspension is the same double wishbone design found on the Accord sedan, with coil springs added in the rear to handle the wagon's extra cargo capability. It provides the same sharp handling as its sedan counterpart and did a good job of soaking up Ohio potholes, even with the full passenger load. Total cargo volume with the split rear seat folded down is 64.6 cubic feet. Front passenger space is good, virtually the same as the sedan, but hard seats made the rear cabin feel a bit uncomfortable. Prices for the Honda Accord wagon start with the manual transmission equipped LX at $17,300. $18,050 will buy you the automatic. Move up to the EX and you'll pay $19,050 for the manual and $19,800 for the automatic. The Accord Wagon is now on sale at your nearest Honda dealership. Watch for a complete MotorWeek road test in February. Along with all the test cars we see here from week to week, we keep a fleet of cars for the long term. Cars that generally accumulate 30,000 miles of MotorWeek driving in a year. The purpose of keeping these vehicles is to see how they'll hold up and to give you some idea of what to expect should you decide to buy a vehicle like one we're testing. It's time to once again check in on our long-term test fleet. Time to say farewell to one member and hello to another. It seems like only yesterday that our Subaru Justy ECVT arrived at Motor Week. The revolutionary continuously variable automatic transmission that its tiny 1.2-liter three-cylinder engine drives is supposed to deliver the fuel economy of a manual. Well, it does. Our final mileage tabulation is 36.1 miles per gallon. That's even better than the original road test some 18 months ago. That also equates to a very low cost of operation of only four cents per mile. But although we have picked the Justy as our best bargain car for two years running, we have mixed feelings on the ECVT. The one in our car took careful dealer adjustment before it would pull smoothly. 
Even then, the balky shifter left us wishing for a manual transmission. But if you insist on an automatic with your high mileage, it is the only way to go. The only other justy problems were a broken door handle and a rough running engine during cold idle. Our Justy had a carburetor, but new models used fuel injection that cures the idle problem. All in all, the Subaru Justy gave a fine long-term performance and withstood our hard usage very well. We will miss this Justy, even with the ECVT. Our Chevrolet APV minivan continues to provide flawless mechanical service, although the interior trim is showing some weakness. Two upholstered panels at the rear hatch have sprung loose. The sliding side door is easier to open now, but the window pops open when you close the door. We continue to be pleased with its versatility and seating. Changing seats around is a breeze. It is also very comfortable on the highway. Mileage up a bit remains good for a minivan at 21.1. Our cost of operation currently stands at a reasonable 6.1 cents per mile. Our APV is serving us well. Our Ford Explorer was completely trouble-free during this period, although we did become annoyed at a couple of items. During long trips, the front seat belts rub against your neck. Height adjustment would seem the only cure. Also, the ignition switch lacks a positive detent for the off position. This makes key removal a struggle on most occasions. We, on the other hand, are fond of the comfort and utility the Explorer provides. Its performance off-road continues to be stellar. When it comes to on-road drivability, our only wish would be for a bit better fuel economy. It currently stands at 17 miles per gallon, with an operating cost of 7.8 cents per mile. Given the higher fuel prices we're all experiencing, we consider between 7 and 8 cents average for cars. As is our custom, when we lose one long-termer, we gain another. Our latest invitee is this 1991 Mitsubishi Eclipse GSX. We picked this Diamond Star Coupe, along with its Eagle Talon Twin, as best sports coupe last year. This year, it gets even better with optional anti-lock brakes. We'll stop by again soon to see if our enthusiasm for this sexy all-wheel drive coupe continues. Next time we meet, Craig Singhaus will return with a story about Italian cars. Lisa Barrow will look at BMW's hydrogen-powered car. And Pat Goss will tell you how to make your engine last longer. We'll also have a new car road test and all the latest motor news. I'm John Davis. We'll see you then. Motor Week 91 is made possible by the financial support of public television viewers like you. If you'd like a transcript of this program, send $4 to Motor Week Transcripts, Owings Mills, Maryland, 21117. Residents of Maryland at 20 cents sales tax. Ask for show number 1014. is a production of Maryland Public Television. This is PBS.